Bobby Fink always says this, it's way easier to race from just a little bit behind. Huh. So I think there's a lot of people in the four free that don't want to jump out and be the leader. Welcome to Social Kick. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a partial crew, Luke still off in London town, but we got Dr. John Mullen and joining us from the Florida Gators, Karen Smith. What's going on, Florida? I'm just very, very good. Doing great here in uh, Gainesville, Florida. Having a great time training, getting some work done. Now's my time to disclose that I was at home uh, at my parents' house in Atlanta for Christmas, and I realized that I still have a bunch of Florida stuff in there because my dad's a Florida grad from uh -huh. the 70s. Even though I grew up with Auburn, Auburn alum. I, yeah, well, and then I went to Auburn, but at least I put, picked the, like, the lesser of two poisons because – I took two recruiting trips to Florida, but it was Florida, Georgia, or Auburn. And then my dad was like, all right, if you got to pick between Georgia and Auburn, if you're not going to go to Florida, at least you went to Auburn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with him on that. I bet that gear that you said it's from the 70s. Yeah, I've got like, well, some of his stuff's from the 70s. Some of mine's from like the 90s, but I, I do so. have like, I got some old memorabilia and stuff that I used to collect. I loved that era when I was in high school, like just collecting antique stuff. And yeah, so I'm, it's an I odd collection. Get my hands, I might want to get my hands on some of that old stuff. That's, I love the vintage look of some of the old um, sports memorabilia. Dude, I got some, uh, they're like, I don't know what you call them. It's not like a, uh, it's, they're, they're large kind of beer mugs, but they're clear. And they've got the old school gator on it, which I think was, like the the tattoo that Lochte has on his shoulder, which yeah. actually I kind of modeled. The, I have an Auburn Tiger on my shoulder, and I kind of – I remember going to Ryan at SECs in 2006, I think, and being like, hey, man, like, can I take a picture of your tattoo? Like, I love that style. And I so I ended up making one kind of similar in Auburn. Um, but it's the same one that he has on, like, these mugs, and they got, like, the classic UF on there too. So, uh, yeah, man, next time I'm home, I'll <laughs> – they, they could be yours. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we're excited to chat with you. We did have a, a few audience questions to kick us off that uh, people submitted on Instagram. If you want to submit any questions to us, follow us at Social Kick Swim. Karen, this one's from Forensic Swimmer. Wants to know for uh, jammers, you go high waist or regular? Regular waist. I, am, I have a very oddly shaped uh, waist and hip. Like my circumference of my waist and my hip and like, all the way around the widest part of my thighs are exactly the same. So when I wear a high-waisted suit, a lot of water tends to leak in through the crest of my back. So yeah. very uncomfortable for me. I much prefer low waist. Uh, what do you think about the strings out though? That's Caleb's thing, the strings out. Do you think he's losing any uh, losing any speed there? No, but <laughs> I tuck them in personally just because I like to be nice and neat. Yeah. All right. This one's from No Context Swim and Dive, New York or Connecticut Pizza. Well, the only place in Connecticut that has uh, competitive pizza compared to New York would be New Haven. And I'll be honest, I haven't had too much New Haven pizza. So I'll say New York for now. I think the best pizza in the world is in a place from Sal's Pizza in Mamaroneck, New York. It's not even in New York City. They do the best squares. My dad grew up there eating the pizza, and uh, he's kept that a tradition for us. We always um, we always binge up on a bunch of pizza when I'm home. Shout out. You should get a sponsorship from those guys. Um, <laughs> They're old school. No way they would do that. <laughs> uh, this one's from Park Yenna 7, favorite meat snack. What are you eating during a swim meet? Um boring stuff basically pretty much meal replacement bars like i eat these things called pro bars they have like a thousand calories in each bar because i need to eat a lot while i'm racing because i just burn so much energy nothing exciting dude i love the pro bars what flavor are you going with definitely i think uh the oatmeal chocolate chip are the best those are pretty fire i like the superfood slam that one's yeah i don't like i don't like the fruit ones very much yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. So in this one from somebody who's uh, just finished fifth, I think at worlds, the 50 free, Mr. Isaac Cooper wants to know if the 50 is a real race. Of course the 50 is a real race. Um, I probably would not vouch for the fifties of stroke to be at the Olympics, but the 50 free is a very real competitive race. I'm heartbroken as a, as a person who's the 50 butterfly was my best race. You killed me. 
I think, I just think the Olympic schedule for swimming is so, it's so full already. I mean, it would be, it would be, I think adding the 800s and the 1500s were good, but yeah. even, even any more mixed realize would probably be too much. Swimming was purists, a, if you will. I was an advocate to uh, balance out the gender equality and the distance events first before we added 50s for sure. Yeah. So, um, but I have to say, like, if I was on the USOC, it would be a really hard thing to add more swimming medals rather than like what's coming up new break dancing. We got break dancing in the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so crazy. All right, man. What's, uh, what are you up to? What's going on now? It's, uh, we're here in, well, I don't know when that we'll release this one, but. It's February. What you got going on? Um, as far as my stuff in the pool, we just came off a little bit of a racing cycle the past three weeks. Uh, we raced in a dual meet exhibit. I'm talking about the pros as in we, we yep. raced an exhibition in a dual meet um, while the college team was doing FSU. The following weekend, we did a couple exhibition races while they were doing their first chance invite that was in Gainesville. And then last weekend we were in Orlando for sectionals. So um, those three weeks were really nice. I love to race. I love to race back-to-back -back weekends too. I think it's a really good form of training. But uh, this week, I think we started our final push for our um, aerobic base because yardage definitely went up this week doing a lot of long course. And that's probably gonna be the case for the foreseeable future, at least the next few weeks. Like Brian said, we're in February. We have a uh, world championships going on right now. Um, maybe tell us about why you chose not to go to world championships and if that was an individual or just a, a, a group decision with the whole Florida pro group. I chose not to go to the world championships because I was not invited. I was not selected. Oh, yeah. yeah. Luke and David, um, they clinched their spots. Yeah. I did not qualify. Yeah. I think if a spot was offered to me, I would have been 50, 50 on going. Um, watching this week i definitely have fomo but at the same time i feel like I'm getting some really good work done it'll it'll be i think it would have been good either way what do you think and, about these like years where we've got the two meets i mean i think it's kind of strange just to have it and obviously like it's a it's a great opportunity to race a lot of elite competition that's what meets are throughout the year anyway it's just like okay well, pick it whatever your peak meet is and also I think like swimming's heading in a direction that's Olympics will still be king for the foreseeable future but like you know it is evening out like there are people that can go and maybe win a world title and that could be a launch pad for their career right now so I'm not like it's, it's still a good opportunity but it is kind of a, a strange thing to see a quote world championships that's maybe still not showcasing all of the best athletes in the world yeah this was a weird one because it was um it kind of functioned as an extra one in already a quad that was shortened to three years. So, you know, typically we have two world champ, two long course world championships in a quad um, and then the Olympics, but this year in our little three year cycle, we had three long course world championships in an Olympics, which it just seems very compact right now. Cause we're, everyone's still trying to catch up from those, from that missing year. Mm -hmm. um, but once we get back to, Oh, it's a beautiful cardinal outside. Sorry. Once we get back to um, uh, back on pace after the Olympic Games, you know, it, it'll definitely um, it, a world title will mean um, a lot more. I think once we get back on pace. Not that not to discount the world champions that are going on right now, but um, there'll be a, a really big focus for the whole world. You know, for those summer long course world championships. You mentioned, you know, after the Olympics and, and even before you mentioned loving to race and you're kind of doing some some lo more local meets as a pro. How do you think the current scheme is with like, um, you know, the, the World Cup series? Obviously, we have the ISL that appears to be fizzled out now. I think everyone's kind of come to that realization. Um, do you think the the current kind of meet schedule is, is, is conducive to fast swimming for pros or ways to continue to keep you motivated? Yeah, I'm a little bit different than the other pros of Florida because I'm like, I'm a sucker for racing. I <laughs> eat up the World Cups. I was in Europe for those three weeks. I had a really good time. Uh, I think for me, when I race, especially like a couple weekends in a row, I come back to training even better than I would if I just trained for 
months at a time. So for me, it breaks up uh, training and I can always pinpoint exactly what I need to adjust or fix in my training when I get back from a, from a meet or a string of three meets. Um, yeah, I feel like I have a lot of tools to, to race well throughout the year as a pro. And you're kind of hitting at a few things there. Do you think it's, you know, mostly physiological things that you're learning, psychological things you're learning with going to, to these meets? Is it like you, you kind of mentioned motivation as well? Um, definitely a little bit of both, probably more physiological than anything. Okay. You know, when I, when I get that central nervous system going for, um, you know, racing, racing weekends, uh, you know, I just feel like more explosive when I come back. I, I feel like I have some more pop, mm -hmm. um, you know, during the world cups, we raced nine days over the span of eight, uh, 17, which is, which is really, really vigorous. And, uh, I came back better than ever after, after I got back from those meets in October. Yeah. Um, you're a guy that uh, specializes not only in freestyle, but you've also showcased like a lot of skill set in the IM events. And I'm just curious, like, where's your training at now, and uh, how big of a priority are our IMs? You know, going into a championship season, or do you kind of just like say, okay, those are those are a third of event compared to 200, 400 free, and you know, maybe even sneaking in 100 free and like, how, where where does that kind of strategy come in for you when you head into like a peak year? Um, we, we swim a lot of IM still. I think IM gives a break from all the freestyle training that we do. Um, it's also for me, like I probably am most aerobically challenged when I'm training IM. So it's a really good tool to help my aerobic base. Um, as far as the speed stuff goes, you know, we're probably doing one of our power sessions stroke or I am and then the other one freestyle same with our quality days so it's a good balance for me I like to balance out what kind of strokes I swim and for the end of the year each year it's kind of nice because the 2 I am always falls after all my freestyle races this year the 200 the 400 and the 200 freestyle will be on day one two and three of the Olympic trials and then I think the I am is on day six and seven so when I get to that point in the meet you know, ideally I'll be solidified on the team so I can, you know, just have fun with it. Hopefully get a little bonus event in is the way I like to approach the 2am. Yeah, that's pretty sweet order to have it in and just be able to roll the dice at the end and play it with house money. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What? So give us a lens of what that looks like uh, in, in training to prepare for it. First of all, like, what did you do this morning? Saturday morning? What, what, what was the training like? This morning we did... I was a hybrid today. So this morning, the first hour we warmed up and the speed guys were alternating between some fifties drill and some partner pulls with the cord okay. while the distance guys were doing fifties and 25s on, um, uh, a less resistant cord, more aerobic based. Like they did, I think, 10 fifties and 12 25s where the fifties were freestyle with fins and paddles. And then the 25s were stroke. Uh -huh. So I was off the hook for that first hour, but then the second hour I joined the long group, which was three rounds of four, 250s, one on three, 10, this is a long course, uh -huh. one on three, 10, three on two fifty five, followed by four one fifties pull on two ten, And the two fifties were kind of like a threshold effort, heart rate 28, you know, getting, getting up there. So we got the volume done this morning. That's for sure. Yeah, really. What's a, and you mentioned, uh, some of the days you're doing stroke for power workouts. What's a typical power workout look like? Uh, we do some buckets. We do, you know, six to 10 reps of, uh, say out to 20 meters and back <clears throat> where we'll go. Um, round one will be breast free followed by some, uh, 25 sprints. Uh, round two will be back breast and round three will be fly back. And then for the following hour, we'll either do something twitchy off the blocks for me or some like uh, an IM set where we're transitioning through the strokes, like fly back and you chunk it with back breast and back breast free at the end. Um, 
just a medley of uh, work that we do on our power mornings. Yeah. How much ownership do you have or input do you have into your training program now? I mean, somebody with the experiences that you've had and like continued sustained success over a long period of time that has to compound your learnings for yourself about your own needs, what makes you pop, what doesn't. You already mentioned like, hey, going to World Cups is really good for you. It helps you just with that sharpness as you come back into training. So like, how, yeah, what's what's kind of the process there? Is there an open dialogue and how much input? Uh, do you have on it? Yeah, it's nice because the coaching staff know that I understand my body really well, but I'm always going to have, I'm always going to listen to what they think first before I give any impact input. Um, you know, over the past five years at Florida, I've done really well. So I, I really haven't deviated much from when I started as a freshman but, you know, if it, there's certain cases where, like, if I, if I feel like I'm really beat up and I'm not performing the way I should, I can go to the coaches, say, hey, we probably should adjust something over the next week just so I can get back on track to where I need to be. Um, but, yeah, there is definitely an open dialogue because I'm, I'm a smart swimmer. They're really smart coaches. So we, we work really, to, really well together. You mentioned kind of the pro group and obviously we're getting right in the heart of college season. So what does the the pro group look like? Who's kind of the main coach overviewing uh, at least, at least you and, and who are you mainly training with? We'll, we'll send all six of our coaches on staff to SECs next week. So right now we're getting some help from old longtime coach of Florida, Martin Wilby. He'll be a saint to us. Um, Probably the GSC head coach will come in and out if we need some extra help. That's John, John Holby. He's great as well. But um, the the guys, the coaches at SECs are still really concerned about us and they, they make sure that we're taken care of. I'm just curious, how close do you follow the things that are happening? Like when SEC starts, are you glued to the results at SECs with Worlds going on? Are you like a swim junkie or do you turn it all off? No, I love I love following swimming. I've been following the worlds all week. Um, obviously, with the SEC guys, like these are my training partners and my best friends. So I really want to make sure that want to follow along and make sure they're doing well. And it's my team as well. I want both teams to win. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I could, I love to watch swimming. I'm an avid spectator. So you mentioned worlds. What uh, stands out from you from from worlds or really surprised you? Um, I can. Uh, make a comment on what I saw in the past hour of sure. the Ukrainian 50 freestyler. Yeah. Black uh, and, yeah. And another swim that I was really impressed with was the French woman's 50 butterfly. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really amazing how she was first to 15. I, I like to watch her dive again. And uh, I noticed that she oscillates and undulates her body more than any other swimmer. In, in the field and um she kills everyone even sarah on the first 15 um like her whole upper body is moving so big and she's yeah. kicking at a much lower uh frequency than everyone else but she she's just got so much power on her kick wow. yeah i think that was uh melanie henik yeah she had a great great first 15 so yeah. you mentioned you know re-watching her start do you when you're watching other great swimmers, are you watching and then you're like, hmm, I want to go try that at practice or tinker with this? Or it's just more curious to see how other people are, are swimming? No, it's 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 interesting because I was thinking on the couch, I was like, hmm, what if I dove in and just kicked like that? But I was, then I was thinking like, <laughs> if I kick like that and the the 400 freestyle, you know, that, I, that could probably actually take a lot out of me <laughs> down the last 385 meters of the race. But for something like a 50 fly, like that's so impressive how she's got so much speed and, you know, it doesn't seem to phase her obviously throughout the rest of the 50 butterfly she's silver metal. What are some of the things that you've learned from other elite athletes in the past that you've put into your own swimming. I mean, the one that I always think about is like when they changed the backstroke finish rule because of us. And then everybody in the world was probably after that happened, testing out their like dive down finish on the 50 backstroke or whatever. Yeah. But like, is there anything technique wise that you've like been able to glean from other people and learn and apply? Um, nothing too dramatic that will deviate from my style. Um, 
I would like, obviously the relay starts, I would never do a step over start in high school because a lot of the blocks in Connecticut don't even have wedges. <laughs> so, you know, that was revolutionary back in whenever 2015 or 16, when I think Texas or NC state was doing that first. Um, you know, just toying with like breathing patterns on hundred freestyles, so, like learning from Caleb a lot and Josh, um, mostly things that I'm trying to excel at, but, uh, I'm certainly not, um, I'm more of a novice, like in the hundred free or, or 200 backstroke say, um, I'm trying to learn from people that are much better than me in those events. So, you know, breathing patterns, what specifically are you learning from Caleb and, and Josh for the hundred free breathing? Caleb has toyed with breathing every four for some, for some of his hundred frees, breathing every other for some others. Josh takes like one breath on the last 25 of his hundred yard free, which I was always trying to do in college. Never got down to it. That's and he holds cool. it together so well. I want to figure out how he can do that. Um, just a lot of watching and learning. And then how about the other, you know, side of it? When, what do you think when other elite swimmers watch you swim at worlds or at the Olympics when they're like, man, I want to, go try what Kieran's doing or how, how does he do this? What is the thing you do that you think other elite swimmers kind of pause at or rewind? One thing for certain, I think in the past few years is if you ever need to find me on like a data sheet, you just look for the lowest um, amount of strokes. I, I think I'm taking the least amount of cycles in those fields by quite a bit. I'm usually uh, 14 to 15 cycles per 50 in the 400 and 200. So if somebody wants to take a look at my stroke and say, how does he carry so much length and power through his stroke? Maybe that's something someone's learning from. Well, other than being a pretty tall athlete, what uh, tips would you give someone to work on that stroke length? I was really, I paid a lot of attention to my stroke counts in high school. I started counting my strokes every single length, uh, probably when I was 14 or 15 and that's kind of when I was going through my growth spurts and gaining a lot of strength. So, you know, one week I'd come in and I was taking 13 strokes of length. And then a couple weeks later I'd come in, I'd lengthen it out a little bit, work on a stronger kick. And I was taking 12, 11, 10, nine. Um, and then once I got to college, like it was, it was pretty much solidified on, on how many strokes I would take. And from there it was, since the the efficiency was there, it was about building speed and more more strength in in that style of stroke that I had. I'm curious what you're working on now. Uh, what are like the biggest things besides time based goals or making Olympic teams or winning Olympic medals and all that? Like what what are some of the things that like either from a technical standpoint or training standpoint that you're trying to? What's like a nut that you're trying to crack? Um, in the past few years, I've struggled the most in the world and Olympic finals over the last 50 in the 200 and the last 150 in the 400. So right now I'm working on my lactate tolerance. I, I want to push my, my quality sets really hard up front. And, you know, when the stroke starts to break down and the body starts to break down, maintaining speed still haven't figured out how to do it. <laughs> like my quality workouts this week were pretty poor, could not hold it together down the stretch of the last round or two of whatever we were doing. Um, but that's a big thing. Uh, another thing is just building a lot of strength in the weight room right now. You know, the pros are like in this dead period. We're not, where we're not going to race too much um, until April, May. So, you know, we, do our weights in five week cycles. The last five week cycle is really good. I've put some good numbers in the weight room and I'm, I'm going to push it again in these next five weeks. And then we'll start focusing on our speed on our lifts and, you know, toning down the, the weight as we approach Olympic trials. Mm -hmm. What, a what's an example of lactate tolerance set that you're doing? And I guess, what are you trying to, you know, go or accomplish on those when you'll feel like, okay, I'm, I'm doing well on these lactate tolerance sets. This is improving and I'm, I'm going to be able to, or it gives you that confidence to, to maybe close those races. One of the classic ones that we do that uh, I think is really beneficial is we'll go eight fifties from a dive long course, and we'll go four on two minutes, two on one thirty, two on a minute, 
I will go through that two or three rounds, depending on how far we are from a meet. Um, and that simulates really good um, lactate production. You know, the last 250s really feels like the end of a 200 freestyle. And, you know, if you do it right, you know, you shouldn't, I, I feel like I shouldn't be deviating more than a half a second to a second between my fastest and my slowest. That's a good indication of if I'm doing a good job, you know, maintaining my speed of my stroke throughout the set. When you were saying that you're still figuring out kind of that tricky balance of how to pace appropriately to like finish the race, um, you know, at an elite level, uh, it, it was reminding me of, and you're going to remember this better than I do. Uh, but I swear, like you've got some balls because you've <laughs> raced in a number of different ways. I've seen you go out hard and fade. And I've also seen you close well. And I feel like one signature of yours is I don't know what your race strategy is going to be. Uh, and it's kind of, that makes you exciting to watch, but what was, there was a 500 free. I don't know if it was SECs or NCs where you were like way out front and faded. Um, but, but I had to say like, you know, how else are you going to learn where the limit is unless you put yourself out there? But what, what, what was that race? So that was my 500 free at SECs in 2021. Okay. Uh, the previous year in 2020, I had gone 406.3 for the first time. The oh. following year in 21, I tied it. But oh. <laughs> a big difference was, is I think I was two seconds under my pace at 250. I flipped in 200. Um, <laughs> that one hurt a lot. I think I, I, I lost some brain cells that day, especially because... <laughs> Uh, Jake McGahey as a freshman was really running me down hard and yeah. I had to extend my kick out quite a bit on the last 25. So, um, yeah, very, two very different ways of swimming a four Oh six, three. Yeah. One will sit with you for a few days after that for yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 Go ahead, John. Any examples of you really bonking it hard like that at practice? Like you said, ideally, that set you mentioned earlier with the fifties, you want to have, you know, a certain spread between the fifties, but I'm sure you've had some workouts where you've really gone all out just to push yourself more. And it, it really bit yourself in the, in the back end, like that race, any, any sets come to mind there? Um, I, for the most part, I stay pretty composed throughout a workout. Even if I'm really, really hurting at the end, I can maintain pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. There was a couple of workouts in Christmas training where I just, I started the set leading a lane and I ended up like dead last, had to throw a snorkel on one day and just swim slow and just try to make the intervals. But yeah, there's certainly examples where I, I can hurt pretty bad at the end of a set. What do you think? I think it's been a topic in world swimming for quite a while on the 400 free and like ever since. Thorpe and Hackett and anybody else who was like dancing around like 341, 340, uh, and Soon Young. Like, where what makes that race so challenging from a pacing standpoint? Because from my observation as someone who'd never raced for and free, it seems like that race is so much about racing, more so than you know, pacing necessarily and swimming your own race. And I wonder if people in the field like you feel that way. Are you swimming your own race? Are you swimming against the field? And like, what is what are the unique challenges for the 400 free as compared to like a 500 free yards or the 200 free that just make it like, you know, people are kind of stuck around that, you know, really fast number in the low 40s. Yeah. Well, a couple things. The world record is so far out there because or it's been so stagnant for so long because there's this guy named ian thorpe who <laughs> didn't have anyone to race he was racing his own race every single time he swam the 400 uh -huh. and he was like an alien in 2001 and swam a 340 which is just ridiculous for that year um and then since that like i feel like compared to the rest of swimming times like 341 is still it's not slow it's not a slow time even though the world record has been the same for so long um it is true i would say the 400 free is like it's like a mile on the track right there's rabbits there's people that hold back 
there's people that just sit in the pack. Um, there's not, yeah, there's not a whole bunch of racing your own race in that, from that, um, in that field. Uh, just think about the, the Tokyo 400 free where I was bronze. I mean, it was like the slowest 400 free in as far back as I could remember, just because everyone was just looking around the, the guys in the middle were charging back after 200 and the guys on the outside were, you know, the rabbits and for me to win that bronze is like right place, right time, just because I had the gold medalist to my right. And I was, it was just a pure race. But why, why? Like it's, it's the, the difference, the strange that like the differences in track, you actually can get it behind in the pack and there's drafting strategy and, but like in swimming, yeah, maybe there's some of that, but you really are in your own lane. So I've always, as, as like a 50 freestyle, 50 butterfly, I've always been like, you're, you're not looking around at all yeah. and there's no advantage to it. I'm just curious, like, why is it this way? Why don't you just swim with your head down? And is it just that hard to do? I don't know, actually. I mean, it's a long race to try to disregard the rest of the the, the field. And like, yeah. if, if I'm a guy that wants to blast out the first 200, like it's, it's really demoralizing if you get run, like if you get start, get start to get run down at like 250, because it's like, oh, wheels are off. Like, but it's, it's way more, Bobby Fink always says this, it's way easier to race from just a little bit behind. Huh. So I think there's a lot of people in the four free that don't want to jump out and be the leader. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder too, just about like the impact of being really fresh on your pacing and you know, that maybe is this, does it happen to you at all that when you're really fresh that, whatever you got to go 27s is it 27s or 28 like well when you're saying I'm not, off i'm at made it 27s it used to be 28s now it's 27s <laughs> <laughs> that's so crazy 27s long course on repeat um but you know i'm wondering if that feels different and maybe like when you get in a race like that you have less of like certainty that if you were to go whatever pace you were planning to go that you could count on and trust the fact that you were sticking to your pace, you know, cause we've all had races where we felt like garbage beforehand or we felt really great. And then you didn't swim as fast. So like, of course, if you see somebody else jumping out, like, like, uh, you know, the Korean is like always going out fast. Well, if you have something like that, there's a rabbit out there. You're like, you may not know if he's going 26 sixes, or if you're going, you know, it, like, you just, it may like impact your confidence in the pace that you're actually going. Is that a factor? I think so. I mean, just to think about Elijah Whittington's silver medal performances from these worlds, he was, I think, 150.6 or seven to the 200 and the 400. And it looked like he was really, it, uh, I mean, with how fast the Korean was out, it looked like, you know, he was standing still. But then, you know, he reeled him in, almost won the gold. And then in his 800, when he was the rabbit, he was 151.6. Like, to me, that that I couldn't fathom going out in 151 in an 800. <laughs> so, like, it, it is a super weird race to where he can earn silver medals at the World Championships in both those races and only go out a second slower in a distance that's double the meterage. So... so what I am always curious about is if you lined up the world or Olympic finalists in um, in a 400 final and like there was uh, dividers in each lane, like and you couldn't see anyone around, like who would be uh, the best at that format where it was just you have to time trial, basically. Well, I was going to kind of ask that if everyone swam by themselves or it was in a vacuum. What is the best foreigner free race strategy in your opinion? Uh, if you're time trialing, you probably got to blast the first 200, like like what Jake did at the Olympic trials when he was trying to make his team. I think that produces a pretty good time if you have the have this training to back it up over the last hundred when you know you turn into cement. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm curious what you think are your greatest strengths. Uh, like what's something that, you know, are you, are you just like a filthy kicker? Are you extremely good at pulling? What are some of the things that you're like elite at? 
Uh, I think I can push off the wall pretty well. I love short course swimming. I had a really good time at the short course worlds last year in Australia. That was probably my, has been my best meet as a pro so far. Um, I mean, I'm definitely not a very fast puller. I can't really pull at a top end speed like other guys can in my groups. Um, I'm probably one of the better kickers in our group and I can kick pretty fast for a short amount of time. Give me an example. But, uh, it's, a, it's for me, it's, it's, I'm a pretty balanced swimmer, you know, what I can pull, what I can kick and what I can swim are probably nothing is glaringly out of sync with those, with those disciplines. All right. What about outside of the pool? It's oh, again, a weekend in February. What are, what are you, what are you, what are you up to? What are you uh, reading? What are you watching? What do you go? What are you going to see? What's going on? I love cooking. Uh, I'm going to have a little dinner party with my buddies tonight. Nice. My girlfriend. What's on the uh, menu? I'm making a big menu tonight. I'm going to cook some red snapper with beurre blanc. Um, oh, yeah. A pasta course, roasted red pepper pasta course, and some rib ribeye with a red wine pan sauce. And, uh, oh. After I'm all done here, I got to make my dessert. I'm going to make some chocolate mousse. Wait, so we're going snapper and pasta and ribeye? Yeah, a little four course tasting menu. What's wow. the address? <laughs> <laughs> Might be worth What's the flight. What do you think, B? Yeah, yeah really. It's going to be a big menu tonight. This is probably the most ambitious uh, menu I've put together. So I hope it turns out good. How long have you been doing this? What's uh, What are some other specialties of Chef Karen? Um, I made a really good pho over the Christmas time at home. That was really nice. One wow. of my favorite. If, if I was on death row, that would be my last meal choice. Wow. Yeah. So the talk about a variety of cuisines. Are you, uh, have you always been, uh, what's somebody's like a, a movie buff. They're a cinephile, right? What is it for a, uh, what, what do they call someone who's really in it? Like culinary, a file. Gastronomic. Gastro <laughs> I'm, I'm into gastronomy. That's for sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. where does this come from? Have you always been this way? Yeah. I was, I watch a lot of YouTube videos on cooking. Um, you know, guys, some really serious guys like, you know, like Marco Pure White or some really laid back, silly guys, like Maddie Matheson. You, cooking videos are really entertaining to me, especially when there's like a, like a production involved with it. Are you getting into the GoPro on the head um, cooking videos where you're seeing all that? <laughs> or are you, are you like a little bit more to it? No, I get stressed enough as it is just cooking. So I couldn't imagine trying to make content either <laughs> at the same time. I don't know. I think you might have a, a future with it. Cooking with Kieran. Who was uh who was the pro summer that was doing some cooking stuff for a while? Um, well, I know Chase Kalish is a good cook. He's posted some of his stuff online, yeah. but I think Zach Harding would uh walk us That's through right. his, Is that right? Zach, yeah. 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 Yeah, we talked to Zach a bunch about that. Uh what what do you think about like the age of everyone's a content creator and that being like a big potential contributor to professionalism and athletics. And like, there's some people that, you know, are even coming out of from high school, thinking like Libby Dunn coming in for like a gigantic following. And now, you know, she's just a college athlete. Like yeah. what, what influence has that had on you at all? I mean, it's all about, you know, expanding your brand. Like this podcast is a great example of, it's beneficial for you guys, obviously, because you have a good uh, following on Instagram and um, all your social media stuff. But it's also really good for the athletes because people get to take a look at their personalities a little bit more and you just make a few more fans through content creation. Yeah. Is there anything that you've thought about, uh, like ways to monetize it for yourself and create some longevity in your career? Um, not, not to that point quite yet. You know, I'm still, I like to do interviews whenever I get the opportunity to, and Speedo does some really good content with us, um, that I like to post. But as far as like trying to create content for myself, I'm, I'm still pretty much a hundred percent focused on just the aspects of training in the pool. So, you know, my, my time is valuable to me for, for putting all my energy into that. Yeah.
with the content creation and social media, that's certainly, you know, an issue for athletes nowadays, but it wasn't in past decades. Um, if you could pick which decade you'd be a pro athlete, what decade would you pick? Now. Okay. Yeah, that's that seems it, it, definitely for swimming. Like right now, I think is the time to be a pro swimmer. All right, but if you had a choice to race in uh, those like paper suits, size twenty four versus what you're racing in today, would you uh, would you race in the banana hammock budgie smugglers or? I think I think I would race really well in uh, just a brief. I, I think I train well in a brief, and I can put together some good quality sets. Um, when we're unsuited. So yeah, I think I would love the paper, like terrible briefs. What about from like a back to double click on John's question a bit, like besides the professionalism standpoint, is there an era of elite swimmers, especially somebody who follows the sport like you that who are some historical swimmers that you would have loved to have been in the heat in the race with them? Well, I mean, I'm 23 years old. So when I was first getting into sport was like 07, 08, 09. So, you know, the Natalie Coglins, Phelps, Lochtes of that era was pretty cool to introduce the sport to me. Um, and I was super, super lucky to kind of get the very tail end of Phelps's campaign in 16. You know, that was when I was starting to go to the pro series meets and I was at the Olympic trials. Um, so that, I mean, that's a, that seems like a really cool era to be a, be a swimmer in. Yeah. Are there any other, um, older swimmers that you felt like you modeled your stroke like growing up? Um, I think I, I'd like to watch swimming videos a lot when I was in middle school and high school. So probably, probably Thorpe's, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to model a stroke that beautiful and I'm definitely nowhere near the capabilities that he had. Um, but I love to watch his 200 and 400 freestyles. I think it was pretty masterful. Yeah, I still like to watch those races. Just yeah. hard to imagine like replicating such a beautiful stroke. And every time I'm in the water, it's like, makes me aware of all the <laughs> imperfections <laughs> of, yeah. of the stroke that I have, especially trying to maintain it over that distance. Yeah. For him, it's like no wa wasted movement ever. Yeah, exactly. That's so wild. I'm curious, just like if we go back to the the group that you're training in, because I mean, it, it is kind of a pinch yourself type of elite level within the group when you consider like all the different, like the metal tally <laughs> amongst your training group alone is ridiculous. And I, I'm sure you guys know this and it's been published, like what place Florida would have finished in the Olympics yeah. by, by itself. I don't know what it is, but it's probably like third or fourth. So like, what's just... What are some of the things from like a, an elite performance standpoint that you see from different people in the group on a daily basis that makes that level is like produce the results that it does? Um, I mean, for me, I like to take notes of the guys that are better than me, not only on their good days, but their bad days. I like to learn from them in all aspects of um, how they train. And I'm so lucky that I'm kind of a hybrid swimmer where I could be like this morning I was with Katie and Bobby for the, the long set, the long course meter set. But a couple of days ago I was with Caleb in the, in a sprint group with after power. And then, you know, outside of the college championship season, I'm with Jake Mitchell every day, pretty much. I'm with a bunch of international guys that really step up to the plate and keep us honest. Um, yeah, it's a really, really cool setting that we have right now. I wonder how uh, anything has has changed over time too with the group that's gone, like come in and gone out. I mean, like we see somebody like Josh who was super elite on his own, and then you know he comes in to assimilate from the group. What are what are some things like you've been able to observe these people learn and grow? Um, and I'm sure that has an influence on you. Is there anything that you see like? the development of your teammates that you're going, Oh, wow. Like they've really made strides in this area. And that's uh, inspiring to me to then, you know, be able to continue to bring it on a daily basis and learn. You, you've seen anything like that. I think it's more group wide than individual um, 
because I feel like a few years ago, maybe, you know, we're at the University of Florida, the distance group, you know, we bang it out. We do a lot of, we do a lot of work and, you know, maybe in years past, we would catch ourselves complaining a lot and especially in the locker room, just, just okay. talking about how eh, that was BS today, whatever. But now we keep each other really accountable for being, for having good attitudes and, and not complaining too much. Um, and it's like, with the guys that we train with, we're also funny and just joke like talkative and we have a really good joking manner while we're in the pool. So it's like, how could we complain when, even if this set's so, 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 so hard and so terrible, we were, we are all in the same boat and it's like, you might as well keep a good attitude while you're doing it. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how far that goes, but who's the ringleader? Who's a, uh, who's a class clown? Um, one of our freshmen, his name is Andrew Taylor. He's a goofball. He's been giving us some good energy. He likes to uh, talk trash to Katie, which I don't think anyone's ever done before. It's quite funny. It's really funny to observe. What's well, an back? example of, of what he says to Katie? Well, one of his, <laughs> his prime examples would be um, his best time in the 800 freeze, 806. So like, if he beats Katie in a rep, he'll be like, hey, you just got beat by the second fastest female performer of all time in the 800. <laughs> and... It's quite funny. We all get to that. That does, that is pretty ballsy to throw shade at, at Katie, especially as a freshman. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, didn't expect you, I didn't expect you to say freshman. What are uh, what are some things your your coaches do that are really annoying that they should stop doing that makes you guys complain during practices? Oh, nothing. Our coaches are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, sometimes uh, during practice, I don't know. Sometimes there can be some miscommunic miscues, miscommunication where will uh, start someone will be called for one pool and they'll get thrown out of the pool to a different group and i mean it's just small things nothing crazy what's what's like one thing that you really loathe though from a from like a training standpoint like i remember hating to do lung buster type of you know breath control on tight interval sets uh, is there anything that whenever somebody gives a set that you're like, God, I fucking hate these. <laughs> I have gotten progressively worse at like long reps in long course, especially on very short. So like, if I'm outside and we're given a set of like 600s on say like seven minutes, I'll, I'll be quite annoyed. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the main thing that comes into mind. Oh, also, like, if <laughs> if we're getting ready for the championship meet pretty soon, and say I'm, like, six to eight weeks out, yeah. and on Friday morning we go IM, if, if I'm thrown into the 4 a.m. group six to eight weeks out, I'm going to be pretty upset. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be like, hey, guys, trying to make the team in the 2 a.m. You know, I really <laughs> like to work on my speed this morning, but – uh they know best, right? Yeah, your microphone wasn't on. They didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. It's like every week. It's like week after week. I'm like, hey, can I go in the two IM group? Nope. This is, this is an example of putting the trust in the coaches and you not having the input. Yeah, I'll complain for like one minute and then I'll start the set. And whatever. So tell us more about your personality and how it fits in with these different groups. Is it more kind of just lead by example or are you also throwing a, some comedic relief in there? Uh, whenever I can, if I think something's funny, <laughs> but you know, there's a good balance between all of us saying chirping and chiming in when we need to. What's, what's your sense of humor? Who do you think is funny? What do you, what do you watch? Uh, I don't watch a lot of comedy specials, but I have enjoyed John Mulaney's Netflix specials. Mm -hmm. His recent one was, um, very self-deprecating and quite funny. Um, I enjoyed that. I'm trying to think who else. Like Jim Gaffigan has some pre has a pretty dry sense of humor. That's pretty good. That's all I can think of at the moment. I'm going to a Burt Kreischer show tonight. I've never seen him live. I'm pretty excited to see see him. I think it should be good. You know that is. He's like Maybe the dude. If I saw a clip of him, I would know, but I can't think of him off the top of my head. He's like the dude who takes his shirt off. He's like, oh, sure. see, that's all you had to yeah. say. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, Karen. Well, we'll we'll hit some rapid fire and then we'll let you go. All right, that's it.
What's the hardest race in swimming? 400 IM. Olympic gold or world record? Olympic gold. Uh, Olympic medal on a relay or an individual world title? Olympic medal. On a okay. Relay. GP in the pool? Yes. What's the best? Oh, this one's actually from Lanny Pallister. Uh, what's the best thing about training in the Florida program? Uh, the sun in the summer. There it is. There you go, Lanny. Uh, if you could add any event to the Olympics, what would it be? Um, I would add short course meter swimming to the Winter Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a unique one. I haven't heard that one yet. What is a event that you don't get to race ever that you think that like, if you took away like your freestyles and I am what, what's an event that you would be really good at? It just doesn't make its way onto the podium of your events. Turn back. Okay. Uh, when will the 400 free world record be broken? July of 2024. Heck yeah. Okay. And this one's from a follower, Kaihu Han Wolf, who says, uh, when will the 200 meter free world record be broken? Oh, uh, I'll say 28. All right. I like it. Are you going to be there in 28? Uh, not sure. Can't tell you. <laughs> okay. All right. And the last one with all the different groups and people you got to chat with there and all the, all the hybrid Florida program that you're on. How often are you doing social kick? Never. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got to do to lobby for some social kick in Florida? I mean, maybe, maybe once or twice before the Olympic trials. <laughs> all right well we got a few months to prep for the great social yeah. kick outing of uh taper 2024 so we wish yeah. you wish you well in preparing for that thank you thank you <laughs> uh thanks for hanging out with those Karen. it's been fun to watch your race for for a long time and really excited to you know have this conversation as a connection to you and watch your race uh this upcoming season um so thank best you. of luck to you man thanks i had a great time Awesome. Likewise. All right. That's it for this episode of Social Kick. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.